Okay, I have a big secret for you guys. The first time I played N64 was in the ninth grade. I played New Soup before Mario 64, it's heresy. I'm a filthy fraud, but I played it authentically, all right? I bet a lot of you younger people don't know what this is, and I wish I didn't either. And around this time, I also watched Let's Plays. Chugga Conroy, Proton John before they were awesome and made a super channel. But I cannot contest the person I watched the most was Nintendo Capri's son. My favorite drink and company, now in a man? So shoutouts to him because he's the reason I even played Banjo in the first place and he's the reason why I call this thing Dr. Jesus. After I saw the Let's Play, I was like, yeah, I like things like Mario. Yeah, I got a Mario machine right there. And luckily I had a friend who didn't play games from two generations ago, AKA a normal person who had Banjo Kazooie that I could buy it off of. Needless to say, I starved that lunch, period. But where Ryle had $15 and a belly full of undercooked cheap pizza, I had a Banjo-Kazooie cartridge lodged in my right pocket. So, who's the real sucker? Banjo-Kazooie was alluring to me because in those times, I'd only played Mario up to Galaxy, so this was sort of like a branch in the Nintendo platformer timeline that I did not get to play. Of course, I didn't touch any of the PlayStation junk. I was a Nintendo console owner, alright. I know there was a Jack, a Daxter, a this, a that, you know, but how many of them still have games? How many of them are on the Nintendo Switch? Okay, fine, that's a fair number. I don't mean to, like, say they're bad, but it was clearly obvious to my young, easily manipulated mind that these guys were just a copy of this. It's just so obvious. <laughs> But we cannot talk about Banjo-Kazooie without the hey listen of video game buyouts. In the early 2000s, Microsoft bought Rare Rare, removing them as a Nintendo-only IP and basically throwing all their valuable properties like King K. Rool throws his crown. Microsoft being Microsoft, min-max destroying the soul of a company. By first buying them, then making them work on Xbox's soulless imitation of Miis, then making them work on Xbox's soulless imitation of Wii Motion games, on Kinect. They played one round of Wii Golf and said, Phil, Phil, get in here! They really thought this thing was gonna change gaming. Imagine a world where you can watch a movie without a remote. The movie theater? Play a game without a controller. The arcade at the movie theater? It's ready to help you connect with the friends and entertainment that you- Ah, oh, man, E3 press conferences back in the day were the bomb. Or should I say they all bombed because they played out like bad infomercials. This is what happens when technology gets out of your way. Mom and dad are sure enjoying this. I wouldn't be caught dead leaving my house without my Kinect. I am convinced we were cheated out of the timeline where platformers became as big as shooters in the 2000s. Just think of it, every game would be a platformer. Halo Adventure, Skyrim 218 G-Flops, Assassin's Creed. But sadly, here we are. Our timeline, where Banjo is in Smash, but also the timeline where we have belly buttons. God, they have pouches over there! So, I think we put it off long enough. Banjo-Kazooie was a game I played 10 years ago and loved. I even consider it one of my favorite platformers, but does that still hold up today? Well, as God is my witness and my hands getting arthritis by the second, let's take on Banjo-Kazooie for the N60. We need to give this a proper home. So I said, is that a corn on your roster or are you just happy to see me? Oh, thank God I got rid of that. Oh, I forgot. This is my trash bin with HDMI support. It's how I turn on my Wii U. And of course, the Zibla. Buying off of here feels like I'm robbing a grave. Imagine, a sea of 360s with millions and millions of expired mom's credit cards. All right, fine, well here, here, finally, we can get into Banjo-Kazooie. It took long enough, I always start my videos with a stupid ass intro, but we're here! This is an intro for the ages. From the onset, you get the perfect hype. The 
music is dynamic and it introduces all of the characters of the game in a goofy and charming way. Nah, you don't need to ask who's Banjo or Kazooie, it's made pretty obvious. W um, well, that's like a horn actually. Banjo horny. A face like that says a thousand words. One of them being celibacy. So let's pick a file and get right into this. Oh, or not, love it. And we get a look right from the jump about the mastermind of this game. Magic pot, more like master plot. That's right, this pot put the whole plot into motion. All because Grunty wanted to be called hot, when really, she's a thought. He couldn't just awkwardly smile and say, you look great. And when she discovers there is someone prettier, she has to logically become prettier than them. And that's the plot. So hey, Tootie. Oh, I mean, goodbye. See you later, because we're not going to see you for the whole goddamn game. Enough of the chit chat. Let's get into the game. As we exit our house, we meet our tutorial guide character, Bottles, otherwise known as our Lord and Savior. Bottles is basically the god of this world. He blesses Banjo and Kazooie with new abilities if they follow him, and if you find yourself low on health, he will heal you with his divine power. In terms of gameplay, instead of giving you all your abilities from the jump, like this con artist, Banjo has you unlock several abilities as you enter levels later. Granted, they only hide a few of them halfway through the game, but there's a constant sense of growth, a constant sense of change in your arsenal, making every level feel different, and then there's Rusty Bucket Bay. And the tutorial area makes for a perfect introduction to all of your moves giving rocks a name and eyes so you feel bad about destroying them. And you know why this tutorial is amazing? It's because it's... <laughs> and finally, we set out on our quest to Grunty's lair. <laughs> Fuck. But look, we always, always reload back to the start of the layer's entrance instead of a vacant front lawn every time you die or reset the game. Mario's Uber's like, hey, this is as far as I can go, buddy. But let's get this game started and get into the nature of just what we're doing here. Hey, hey, I was gonna explain what you do. God damn it. God, just like how everything in Mario has eyes, everything in this game thinks, therefore it is. Ow. While Descartes has a meltdown about this development, why don't I take you through the game, show you the challenges you face and how you exactly overcome them. Banjo's system is a little different from that of Mario's. Okay, so 10 jiggies a level, 100 music notes. What the hell does that mean? Music notes unlock parts of Grunty's Lair, which is actually just a huge level in itself, with different segmented areas that contain levels. Think of it like a huge book, except it's a Goosebumps book, and you have to get to different parts of the book by flipping to other parts, maybe. <laughs> now, it'd be a bit inaccurate to relate things like stars to jiggies and notes to coins, because these are a delectable form of health and collecting a hundred of them gets you a star, somehow. It's really more like stars opened up rooms, whereas your jiggies here open up levels. So it's not just enough to disregard entire levels just looking for jiggies. Collecting notes add value to exploring levels so you can access more parts of the game, and I love value, half of my wardrobe is from Value Village, you couldn't tell? Here, the pause menu offers a delightful screen that shows you the quantities of what you need and what you're missing. Which, if you're someone who constantly pats his legs or buttocks to check if he forgot his wallet every hundred feet, then this is a welcome change from that Amario. Why? Well, I mean, first off, thank you, beautiful white compressed text, I can barely read you, and you're speaking in code. I can mouth off about all oh, this game is charming, oh, it's original and goofy, but by that point, I'm gonna sound like a JoJo fan, and by that time, you're gonna be running away. Why well, don't take you through some of my favorite jiggies and show you some of the levels while we're at it? I got 100% of this game to complete, so I mean, we're not going anywhere. Similar to how stars, moons, or shines in Mario sort of fall into the same categories, so too do jiggies. More often than not, there are a few hiding in plain sight that you need to navigate towards. Others are like this, except you need to use one of your abilities to get to it. Some abilities require a thing. Feathers, eggs, golden feathers. Others can only be accessed when you do one thing and then another thing happens. Then others can only be found with transformations, so you have to complete a certain minigame in a certain time frame. There is really a lot of variation here. And then there's the replacement for red coins. Oh, look, buddy, just take it. Just take it. And that only scratches the surface on what this game includes. It's not a super crazy long game, but I really felt like each time I got something, it was a new experience. 
The differences between these jiggies get more dynamic as we go through the levels, so here we go. Mumbo's Mountain is your first level, so obviously it's more simple. Even right at the start, there's this undercompensating gorilla in his tree that serves as a multi-phase encounter. Look, it's our good old friend Orange from Dream! Then you go and snag some of those oranges for Chimpy. Who? Then you pelt him with eggs. That's like three things we're doing to this gorilla. Poor fucking guy. The main great thing about having to collect all these things is it doesn't just go, oh, I don't have the ability. I'm gonna have to get it and go back to the first level. The thing with Banjo is you can pop into a world and pop out and in one roundabout, you can collect everything in it. The only place that makes you backtrack is in Grunty's lair when they have certain jiggies that can be collected only once you get a new ability. Oh, I forgot one of my other favorite collections. <laughs> oh man, I love Mumbo. I think it's when they introduce him that you really see the charm of this game and <laughs> And updated. To me, when size is incorporated into older games, it really brings these worlds to scale and breathes more life into them. You turn into a crocodile so you can enter a bigger crocodile's nostrils where you face another crocodile and eat smaller things within the same crocodile. <laughs> like at first you only experience the levels in one way, but when your size changes, now you can go to places you never thought you could. Like these games were very limited by the space on the cartridges, so when they change how you interact with the world, it makes them bigger. It makes them deeper. I'm going to freak out if there's no beach level, oh thank god. Treasure Trove Cove has X's hidden around the map that you have to use your flight in order to find and then use your beak buster in order to break. They take you all over the map with your flight ability that you finally get in the second level of the game until you can't find the last one. I, I swear I flew- I love this game, there's even a bucket that talks. Clanker's Cavern has one of the most stressful deep dives in all of gaming. This poor thing is Grunty's garbage disposal. His poor stomach looks like somebody ate wacky workbench. You've got to dive to the bottom of this tank that's murky and disgusting in order to free him from his chamber. All with a hellspawn creature looking at you. Motherfucking gloop. I don't know how I feel about Gloop. Bubble Gloop Swamp, aka my ass, introduces the wading boots. They offer a unique puzzle where you treacherously have to walk through the disgusting goop of the swamp, followed up by a treacherous walk across a narrow path to get a jiggy. This is one of the first jiggies with a big consequence that usually results in your death. I remember my first playthrough, this was impossible with the Nintendo pocky ass control stick. Freeze Easy Peak has the coolest set piece in the whole game with a giant snowman and my husband Boggy. Oh, you don't believe me? Well, it's either Banjo and Kazooie or the mother, or... Honestly, this thing is just so much fun to climb from the scarf, the pipe, the broom, and there's a jiggy right on the hat. Also, you can slide right off the snowman and help a gluttonous and neglectful dad clear his gut. <laughs> no, not from guilt, because he ate an object that obviously wasn't food! And I'm no kombucha, but I really think you should get checked out. Oh, never mind, he wants to race. Seriously, you kids should go to your mother's house. Come over to my house. Gobi's Desert. Fuck this level, but I love you! Gobi is my favorite character in the Banjo-Kazooie games! This stupid dope is trying to get water, but Banjo-Kazooie, because of the objectives, have to smash his humps, his humps, his humps, his humps, in order to complete objectives. And this guy goes to other levels, and he's just so pathetic, I love him. Mad Monster Mansion thematically is one of my favorite spooky levels in all of gaming, but it actually feels haunted, you know? Mario has ghosts and it's like, oh, scary. But it doesn't feel like Halloween, he doesn't feel spooky. This, this has all of the aesthetics, Woo. It's similar to how Freeze Easy Peak has the theme around Christmas, you know, the best part of winter. Removing all of the slush, the shoveling, the bad traffic. That should be the next snow level. Anyways, my favorite Jiggy in this level is shit. Speaking of pinching one out, the final level. Click, clock, wood. It's probably the coolest idea for a level I've seen in an N64 game. It's very imaginative in the limited hardware to make a level that's truly interesting. It's a level with a big tree in the middle that you pitter-patter your pathetic little legs up to the top of to investigate different areas for notes and jiggies. But this level may seem basic until you realize there are four seasons with everything in the level changing depending on the seasons. Some areas, for example, only open up when certain seasons change, where leaves grow and allow for platforming, or a flower blooms in the summer, or the leaves pile up to make paths in the fall. 
or everything being dead in the winter. And it's fun to see how characters and their predicaments change as a level does too. I'd really love to see this concept expanded upon in other games. So that's it, all the levels. So why is it that my bottom can't stop dancing to the beat of this song, it's so good! All that self-esteem you have, better not drop it. The tugboat, the noises, the area just knows it's the nasty final frontier before beating the game 100%. Sure, there's TikTok cock, but nothing comes close to Rusty Cuck at bay. Ah! So you notice this is a review, but I haven't said anything negative about the game. I really like this game. But the elephant in the room is it's kind of archaically designed. It is not a good replacement for Mario 64 or Sunshine or any of the Marios because it is still not very good for beginners. Sure, it shows you all of the moves, but sometimes later in the game, when you need to collect jiggies or notes, there are just challenges that are not up to the skill level that you even presented to the player. And sometimes it's not straightforward anymore. I like a lot of this game because I like exploring, but you hand this to somebody who's never played a 3D platformer and they will not complete it. No way, Jose. But uh, we've got to talk about the engine room. Jesus Christ on the cob. This room's failure condition is instant death. Fun, which means you have to guck your way all the way back to this room, navigate towards everything, and hope you don't die. If you're going for 100%, you gotta go to each corner of this room, get all the notes, and especially the jiggy in the center. And that's not even mentioning hitting the switch to get the propeller jiggy, so... Luckily though, you are in the midst of, say it with me, cat. Nope. Nope. No. Nope. Almost. That's right, a professional average gamer, and I'm here to demonstrate how even you can conquer this extremely tough challenge. The engine room is predictable in the patterns of these platforms, so use that to your advantage when hitting the switch and exit the engine room. Then on top of the ship, make sure you don't get hit by any enemies as they waste valuable time. Talon trot as fast as you can on top of the ship and jump to the bottom, where you hopefully land and swim precisely into the propellers area. It's okay if you die at this point because you at least got the jiggy. <sighs> well I hope that helps you out, get it yourself, but we did it! 100%! We did it! Well, hey, I remember that my old boss used to live in his mom's attic, so that reasonably means that the final boss of this game is up this elevator! We did it! We got to Grunty! We finally did all of the challenges! We got through that hellhole! And we helped everyone we could! Everyone affected by her! And now, we can take her down, get vengeance for everything she's done to us, and save our sister in a trivia quiz show. I love this game. So as extremely in line with this game's character, the way you save your sister and beat the final boss is a quiz show of all things. I don't think something else could prove how strong this game's personality is other than the fact that it tests all of its unique characters, locations, and objectives on the player based on their memory. The thing is, it's doable, and there are so many characters that the quiz is actually something that'll make you think. Maybe I'm biased here because my mind sort of remembers a lot of weird stuff like this. Like, I remember the hexadecimal value of Shrek's green and the number of rings in Radical Highway 329. Ah, oh, remember this. This is when that squirrel was looking for nuts, and now he's looking for nut. Moving on. You pick up items on the ground. Which one makes this silly sound? You are disgusting! Not all games have the balls to do this sort of thing. Challenge the player's memory with trivia about the game itself. Actually, a big part of this quiz is there are unique answers for some questions that are exclusive to your playthrough. Grunty's sister Brentilda is hidden around Grunty's lair. She's trying to help you stop her evil sister with trivia about her. However, it turns out each of these individual categories are answers for the quiz. The only catch is, there are 256 different combinations of each save file that could have answers. Because Brentilda has a category and three unique different answers per. So you can't look up what the answer is, you have to remember it. So. In other words, I'm scot free! So we did it, we caught up with Grunty and answered all our disgusting questions about what she keeps in her pants. Well, see you later, adult diapers, we did it! Finally, saving our sister. That's just been here this whole time, I guess. What happened to the chamber? I thought you were. I thought this was peril, I thought you were almost going to die. And the credits roll, and I really love Rareware games because they make all of the names of the developers these kooky, funny, little names based off of the characters. This credit sequence is so charming, I love Rareware games!
God damn Microsoft. You've ruined it. They had to add all the people who worked on the port, which made this credit sequence five minutes longer, and it repeated all of the character names again. Yeah, they just tried to piggyback off the charm like its name was Joey. And on top of it, the toilet is the last scene of the Microsoft credits in the credits. If that's not amazing attention to detail, I don't know what is. We finally beat the game. After the game, Mumbo and Bottles all come for a barbecue. You're all celebrating because you've overcome everything, and that is the icing on the cake. This game just managed to perfect the charm, the style of collectathon platforming, and it'll always have a place in my heart. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and I will see you on the flip side. Oh, f we didn't beat the final boss. So now, for all the people taken advantage of by this witch, all wanting to see her fall. Remember the hours I spent getting all of these notes? Well, you must be saying, Well, what's the point of getting them after you get every level, you stupid idiot? Well, I was gonna tell you, but if you're gonna call me names, then forget it. I'm not gonna tell you about the new refill on feathers and eggs. Forget about it. Suffer. This battle's hard. I actually recommend getting everything possible if you can. Set atop Grunty's lair is a beautiful scene for the final fight. I mean, you've been ascending this layer the whole game, so it feels only right that this is the final location. Platformer boss battles can sort of feel like a wash. <laughs> Literally all of Super Mario Sunshines are not that unique or challenging, but here, it's a classic rare boss fight. Phases, dynamic conditions, all ending with literally a bullet hell. You require golden feathers to even block this attack. It is so cool. I seriously love this. It just runs the risk of being tiresome to repeat the same fight over and over if you mess up or lose all your health. And I was doing that even though I got the upgrade. This is really hard, but it is fulfilling when you do manage to get through all of the phases and beat this dumb ass. A beep and a bop later and we have one thing to do. Shoot eggs into the Jinjo statues as fast as possible but my ass is getting blasted. Alright, I'm just gonna blast your hole with my eggs! Oh my god, Rare, you're disgusting! And the final smash of the fight has the mighty Jinjinator deal the final blow to Grunty. She's knocked off of her tower, hurtling down towards the- She makes a hole and is crushed under a rock. All right, so now that's it. That is it. We beat Grunty. We got all the collectibles. We made it to the final cutscene. Everybody is on the beach celebrating, enjoying their time together, and Mumbo comes out of the tree showing us they have some secrets when you collect everything, and... Oh, no, no, no. I got everything. I, I, I got everything. What could I have possibly... That kinky bastard. Oh, oh, there was one Jiggy I have to go back to after I get an ability. This is the one in the game you have to do this way. You've gotta get Kazooie's running shoes, then return to race this neglectful son of a bitch and beat him in a race to get the final god damn Jiggy. In the very least, you don't have to refight the final boss and go through the furnace fun again. Once you collect it, it brings you to the final cutscene. <sighs> I've been trying to collect everything in the game to show all of you why it's so worth it. In Banjo-Kazooie, yes, the challenges are pretty tough, but the ending you get, the reward you get, is something that is unlike any other game. Most games, there's a congratulatory message or you get some sort of postcard, but this? You get to see the sequel of the game. You get to see previews about what the other game has in store, and I've never seen that in a game before, and this is so cool. When I got this on the N64 for the first time, I was blown away. So let's see it on the X. These beautiful people at Microsoft changed the text at the end of the game meant to show off Banjo-Tooie to Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts. So, how do you guys feel about this? You must have some time to think about it. You're gonna tell us what the- what- 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 why? They think no one was gonna bat an eye? Change none of the other context clues and just change the text. This is like at Wonderland when all the Universal rides got bought out and they had to change all the names. This is still Italian job, you asses. 
They ruined this franchise that I love. How many times do I have to say this in the same lifetime? There's a reason Banjo and Kazooie were in my intro as early as 2014. I hardly talk about the games, but this is one of my favorite platformers of all time. I personally feel that Banjo Kazooie preserved Mario 64's formula while adapting it in a way that didn't feel like it was mimicking Mario. They didn't neuter the core gameplay they added on top of it instead of just adding water and pretending like nothing happened. Banjo Kazooie is a lot less about 3D platforming. I'm not gonna lie to you and say there isn't 3D platforming, but compared to when you have to use abilities, it feels like a lot of the platforming objectives just rely on using abilities. But that's not a problem, and these puzzles aren't slug sandwiches. They feel conducive to the abilities you have and they feel natural. Once you learn what things are signs to use an item, you start thinking, okay, how do I use an item here? When I get a new item, how do I use it there? And it goes back to what I said at the beginning, where when you get new abilities, it sort of changes how you see levels. What this becomes, then, is sort of do a thing, to get a thing, to get another thing. And while in some levels this is fun, you really feel rewarded when you do solve these puzzles. In others, it sort of feels tedious, because you don't know the order of what you have to do, and sometimes, Getting a transformation, for example, causes you have to go all the way back and then you have to switch back to Banjo-Kazooie and it kinda becomes monotonous. And I've just described my problems with Banjo-Tooie. Overall, I still stand by that Banjo-Kazooie could have been a great evolution of the 3D platforming model, set up by the Mario series of games but adapted by Banjo-Kazooie. And in a lot of ways, I prefer Banjo-Kazooie to Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine even. That's not to say either of these games are even bad or anything. I'm just saying that a lot of this game really perfected what I like in a game. Mario, he sucks. He doesn't even take his shoes off when he comes to your house. He is the worst. But for now, that was Banjo-Kazooie for the Microsoft. In truth, I have to hand it to Microsoft because this port is good. That took a couple years off my life, but I mean, I can't argue. The, the consistent frame rate, the beautiful updated graphics, the widescreen, the that. This port has come really clutch. And as much as I've complained about a few things, it's actually really good because where you didn't have stop and swap in the original Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, they added it in the Xbox Live Arcade. Oh my God, I need that for Banjo-Tooie. Well.